this um, overseeing the introduction of both uh, FM radio services and television in Bhutan from 1997 to 1999. And after that, following, um, I guess, a passion for documentary filmmaking. So on the way, what I believe, a bit of a career transition, achieving a notable success with three international awards and multiple nominations for his film, such as The School Among Glaciers, Rocking the Himalayan Kingdom, Bluff in Bhutan, and uh, The Long Walk to Education. Uh, doctor also served as an adjunct professor at the Royal University of uh, Bhutan and held the position of dean at the Royal Thimpo College. Um, doctor also proudly identifies himself as Tashi Kangpa and of course takes great pride in his Shashab Descent, something that I've learned from his blog. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Doji, uh, to Bhutan Dialogues. And uh, I believe this is uh, your second appearance. Uh, I think you're the only guest that has appeared twice on Bhutan Dialogues. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, that's an achievement uh, from our part, and also, I yeah, guess, um, yeah. an indicator of your popularity. Now, uh, okay. perhaps to, um, Doctor, to kick things off, it would be uh, wonderful to uh, dive into Sir's early years. Uh, as, I, as I said it earlier, I went through Sir's online blog, and it offered glimpses of, uh, humble glimpses on your parents. It 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 would... Hence, I, I feel that uh, before we deep dive into the thesis, it would be nice for us to hear about uh, Sir's roots. I suppose in particular, looking back on the experiences you have had in your childhood that helped shape your values and um, principles that define you today. You know, uh, essentially the kind of childhood experiences that helped define who Doji Wangchuk is today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bhutan Dialogue, for having me back. Um, and uh, it's a great honor. Um, and uh, for me, um, it's a little bit a humbling experience to actually um, talk about my own work. This is so un Bhutanese of us, you know, that we don't like to talk about our work uh, or achievements. Um, I was uh, brought up by my uh, mother and uh, my grandfather. Um, in a very humble uh, family, in a single room hut um, on uh, in, in the upper ages of Tashigang, um, so it's one of the remotest uh, places that you can possibly imagine. Um, um, my grandfather was a hereditary a lama, uh, and so I was supposed to become a lama, take his place, because my mom did not have any siblings. Uh, but but my father, who uh, who was working for the third king back then, uh, had uh, commanded uh, my father to send me and my sister to a modern school, and so uh, so my my destiny or my fate, yeah, had took took me to completely a different direction of modern schoolings and in uh, uh, in a Catholic um, boarding school. I went to study. Uh, engineering science, uh, nothing about uh, spirituality or or so. It's only um, in my third career that I I rediscover uh, spiritualism uh, through my uh, works uh, in the PhD field works. Um, yeah, that that would be yeah, basically uh, how, how, how uh, my upbringing. Uh, and I would say that uh, both my mother and my grandfather had uh, a huge influence. Uh, in my uh, being a Bhutanese, uh, and of course, uh, the, the the schooling years have been have been as defining uh, as well. Thank you, thank you so uh, so much. Sir. It's it's wonderful to hear about um, the, uh, about your roots, especially in terms of the uh, the kind of families that actually helped shape who you are today. Uh, let us move on to your PhD, uh, since we only have an hour. Uh, if doctor could to briefly explain uh, the theme, the theme that you've uh, chosen for your PhD thesis uh, with your audience yeah. today. So, so my field is uh, communication studies, um, a discipline in the social science. And uh, I explored basically uh, the, the interactions that uh, take place on the social media 
I explored the technological affordances um, emerging therein. And then uh, what it means um, in terms of identity construction and community building. So uh, uh, as a communication scholar, it's uh, framed um, within the theoretical perspectives uh, called ethnography of communication. It was, which was first proposed by an American scholar, uh, Del Himes. Uh, who argued that the way we communicate, the way we interact, uh, the way uh, we uh, um, we put uh, ourselves out in the world uh, in any form uh, reveals a lot about our identity and our social cultural practices. Uh, and that was uh, the, the theoretical framework on which I worked. Uh, and uh, it was, of course, a very um, not an easy uh, subject. Uh, it's a, um, I mean, identity and 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 uh, and, and uh, culture are very slippery topics. It's very broad, wide, profound. So it has it has not been uh, an easy task. But uh, I had the time and, of course, a great place to delve on those topics. Very interesting. Uh, I must confess that when uh, when I went through your thesis, especially the title, and of course I started with the title. Uh, you know, the, the topic of identity, spirituality, community, and the sacred <laughs> chronotope in Bhutan. Uh, I'll be very honest, uh, chronotope, it's, it's the first time I heard, and I I had to literally Google. <laughs> but after reading at length, you know, this term really gave me this, this a different outlook on what storytelling can be. So perhaps yes. uh, just... Um, Perhaps if in case there are, especially if there are other Bhutanese audience like me, would you mind explaining this chronotope a bit for them? Okay, uh, the word chronotope um, was um, coined by a Russian uh, philosopher and literature giant of his time, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. Um, it's it's uh, it comes from Greek. Uh, chronos uh, means um, time, and tope means uh, topos means place. Uh, so chronotope uh, together uh, uh, means time and place, uh, and it uh, refers or it uh, it uh, indicates the inseparability of time and space in literature and in in in, in art. So, in other words, uh, 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 the the easiest example is when we, when we are talking about uh, film genre. So, if you are talking about science fiction. Uh, we know that it's it will be set in a different time and place somewhere in the future. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about an epic uh, or, or 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 a medieval story, then we uh, immediately we are taken back to uh, the medieval era, um, uh, in, in in into the into another time and place. So it's it was a literary tool that uh, Mikhail Daktin, um uh, introduced. But later, it found its way uh, in terms of uh, conceptualizing and theorizing certain sociological um, phenomena. And uh, uh, I used uh, uh, it to explain the different time space that different people of different generations in Bhutan find themselves in. I call these uh, the chronotropic identities. So, for example, uh, the chronotope identity of my father's generation is very different than my generation, which is again very different from my daughter's generation. So, I uh, I use that to explain uh, this different time space configuration that is in Bhutan uh, as three different, um, broadly three different generations, as well as to define our own uh, three different identities that we carry, you carry that. Uh, you know, at different point time of our life, and at different point uh, in 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 our day. So that's yeah. In in, in brief, that's the that's the uh, ground rope that I was talking about. Uh, simply, simply fascinating stuff. Now, uh, getting back to your thesis, um, why why did you choose? What was there any you know uh, like a motivating factor behind the choice of the topic? I mean, why this topic? Okay, um, identity is something that I have struggled with um, all my life, uh, like many other people. Uh, and uh, I also observed um, in my own family, uh, my daughter's going through an even bigger identity crisis because my wife is Japanese. And so uh, they uh, had to, they, they were juggling between like, am I Japanese, am I Bhutanese, you know? 
And what really inspired me was actually a short article by Tsong Tse Ken Se Rinpoche, What Makes Me or What Makes You Not a Buddhist or Buddhist, which was uh, an article uh, that he wrote uh, uh, as an extension of his book, uh, What Makes You Not a Buddhist. Uh, that was actually um, the, the inspiration that I drew from. And of course, I also read about the culture construction of, of Buddhist identity by Dr. Karan Ponso and, and his, uh, his theory of the three worldviews in Bhutan. So I build on the works of uh, these two uh, social thinkers. Mm. Um, I think the, um, the ontological question of who am I or who are we, uh, you know, this has been I think, human, uh, mankind's biggest pursuit you know, from the time of the Greek philosophers to Gautama Buddha to modern day thinkers. So uh, uh, I, I got interested, first of all, on a personal reason. Um, and secondly, I think um, uh, as a Bhutanese, we, uh, uh, we are continuing to ask that question uh, every now and then. Uh, what does it mean to be Bhutanese? What is our national identity? What does Bhutan stand for? You know? So these questions uh, have never been treated, uh, in my opinion, in depth by in the academia, so I, I I chose to you know put my head on the chopping block. <laughs> that was such a good decision. We all thank you for that, sir. And and really, I could not agree uh, more on what uh, sir mentioned. That uh, who are we as Bhutanese? I think that question is more rel has never been uh, relevant, especially in the twenty first century, where we have yeah. external forces coming in from all directions. So it's it's it is truly an important topic. Uh, let us now move uh, into the thesis. Uh, in in doctor's thesis, you you talk at length about uh, what constitutes, and I guess it's a perfect segue we've already made with the earlier question on what constitutes a traditional Bhutanese society, or we could say uh, what constitutes a traditional Bhutanese identity. So what do you think are the key character traits that actually describe this traditional Bhutanese society or, or you know, a traditional Bhutanese identity? Yeah. Okay, so um, so as I was saying, like, um, I look at uh, this question uh, through the lens of a communication scholar um, from a social linguistic uh, point of view, um, through mm -hmm. studying the social interactions, both uh, verbal and uh, nonverbal. And from a very communication perspective, um, a traditional Bhutanese uh, society is where uh, communication occurs mainly face to face. Uh, conversation seems to revolve uh, uh, around family, food, uh, farms, and faith. Uh, very simple, um, uh, simple uh, conversations. Um, when I uh, analyze um, these uh, communities. Um, uh, we observe uh, three things uh, that first of all uh, the concept of uh, nature the concept of nature seems to take the center stage in a Bo traditional buddhist community not human beings um and that i think is uh, is the most powerful uh, nature as the most powerful uh, factor in our lives that dictates both the rhythm uh, of and the pace of life um Places uh, uh, are, are, are not just places, but uh, powerful, um, you know, uh, spots of wisdom and stories and, uh, and history. Um, and, uh, and, and when we uh, analyze the conversations, uh, there are lots of nature that comes into being. Uh, uh, phrases like, uh, don't compete uh, with the weather or the nature or... Uh, or, or, or the river. Um, second, uh, the concept of time in a traditional Buddhist society is very interesting, even more interesting. It seems to be circular uh, and not linear. So there is a cyclical uh, concept of time, not linear. Um, uh, best example, uh, our older generation, they really don't remember how old they are. They will tell you uh, what zodiac animal sign they are. So, which means they are not older than 12 years old. <laughs> uh, for them, they don't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, so for them, it, 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 what matters is that life is just uh, a cycle of 12, every 12, 12 years. Um, the uh, uh, continue with the time. Um, 
the concept is again not clock time and it is an event based time uh, 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 going 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 or, or uh, lo uh, looking at how people conceive time so uh, people will never tell you like oh let's meet at nine o'clock or ten o'clock they will say uh i will i'll see you after i release my cows in the jungle <laughs> and who i mean who knows at what time then yeah so even based and not 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 a clock uh, based third um in the traditional community everything is shared life work happiness sorrows uh, when you build your house, uh, it, the whole community comes together, even with food and drinks. Um, nobody expects payment. Um, kinship uh, terms uh, and community are expressed uh, or implied, uh, um, and not only to human beings, but also to nature and to the supernatural. So, for example, uh, in my area, Tashigang, uh, we have a big mountain where, uh, whom, that's referred to as Memeralang, you know, get grandfather Ralang. Um, in Barsam, they have a small statue of uh, Chana Dorji, uh, whom they uh, fondly uh, refer to as Meme Chador. You know? And so uh, these um, personification or anthropomorphism of deities and nature is again another characteristic of a traditional Buddhist society. So uh, what I argue in my uh, dissertation is that uh, a traditional Buddhist uh, concept of self or the identity or the sense of self is that of an interdependent uh, self composed of three things. First of all, the personal self, second, the social self, and third, the spiritual self. And that is what defines a traditional Buddhist identity. Mm. Thank you. So it was uh, beautifully said. I was just, uh, I, I, I would love to hear more, but let's... Uh, do you, uh, I'm just wondering, do you think what you explained about, you know, how Bhutanese uh, traditional society is defined, like the oral conversations or having nature, having a lot of value and the sectic concept of time. And then of course, how it's even based and the labor exchange, to what extent does it still exist in Bhutan? And it, to what oh, extent uh, is it changing? Oh, um, it, it, it exists. Um, now, uh, when I was choosing my th uh, research sites, I chose three uh, research sites. One is this very traditional community in, uh, or perhaps the last uh, frontier of modernization, uh, a small village called Lamga, uh, which was recently in the news uh, because they get cut off from uh, uh, from rest of the world because there is no uh, bridge connecting to that village. Um, they didn't have electricity, technology, or even modern schooling until very recently. Uh, so it was, I think, one of the last uh, tra really traditional Bhutanese uh, community. Uh, the second research site was in Tashi um, a village uh, in in uh, in Keni Geok, uh, which is very typical um, Eastern village. You know that is straddled between uh, modern modernity and uh, and te technology, uh, so that has access to uh, both. My third research, research site um, is a virtual community that does not have a physical location. So uh, basically all the online and, and, and uh, social media uh, chat groups, uh, I followed a couple of, uh, of them. So uh, when I uh, observe, uh, uh, first of all, uh, these three communities, uh, the traditional, the hybrid and the virtual, we see uh, three distinct uh, characteristics, three distinct uh, chronotropic identities um, emerging. Uh, what I also um, observe is this, that these three uh, chronotropic identities are again uh, not uh, only in these three different communities and their members, but also it manifests in us at different level at different circumstances in a, to a different degree. So for instance, uh, my, my father has some uh, idea of how to use technology. My, uh, on the other extreme, my, my daughter who's growing up, she has some uh, faint idea of what, uh, uh, what it means to be Bhutanese and that she should you know, respect uh, nature, time, uh, and, and, and all those concepts that I explained. So uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's there. The three uh, seem to, uh, to, to coexist, uh, which means um, to answer your question, yes, um, there are um, uh, values and customs and, and cultural um, 
nuances still uh, defining our daily lives. Thank you, thank you, sir. Now that uh, I mean, uh, perhaps we deep deep dive a bit on the online communities because uh, a large part uh, section of your thesis is also talks about uh, the impact of social media and uh, especially on the notion of being Bhutanese, the, the notion of the Bhutanese identity. So especially if you zoom into this hybrid uh, the case studies or the online communities, what were the what were the key insights emerging from that? What was the impact on 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 this? Uh, what you shared about uh, how things used to be in the past, and uh, whether it is changing things for the better, or what what kind of you know tangible impacts did you observe during your research? Um, I think if we pin down to just um, one concept, I think. Um... I feel um, how, uh, we are losing uh, the sense of innocence. So the loss of innocence is what is happening uh, in Bhutan right now. Um, it started with the modernization in the 60s, um, uh, but uh, until uh, the advent of social media and technology, I think uh, the change was quite slow. Uh, it was very gradual. But with social media and uh, democracy, I feel uh, it has completely fast forwarded, uh, and that has brought some uh, some identity crisis in many. It has brought an identity crisis to our own uh, country, and I f also feel um, the uh, our government has been completely caught uh, unprepared. Uh, I feel uh, the whole. Um, uh, topic or, or question of extra Australia exodus uh, uh, is a symptom of that loss of uh, innocence. Uh, and, 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 and as I said, uh, when we look uh, from the perspective of communication, social science, uh, uh, when we broaden that uh, uh, and try to interpret, I think uh, it's leading to uh, loss of sense of belonging. It's uh, the, the, the weakening of the social support and community. And uh, we are, and I think we are undergoing a collective uh, identity crisis uh, right now. So uh, that's that is in a nutshell what uh, for me what's happening right now. Thank you, sir. Since um, I I noticed that uh, most of the, the the case studies are from rural settings, would you say this this issue of identity crisis, this collective identity crisis, loss of sense of belongingness, and this loss of innocence, it exists? Uh, at the same level of strength in both the rural and the urban community, or is it more apparent in urban community because the social media frequency of usage is higher there? Yeah, I would say uh, to, it's totally um, among uh, the virtual community members. Uh, so I mean uh, the urban uh, population. Uh, and to a large extent, I think even uh, people of my generation are in that, uh, I mean, uh, facing facing that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would say it, it is much more in the younger uh, demographic uh, and not so much among the people in the old, older generation. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, another, uh, uh, I was wondering, another thing that I was wondering on was that, uh, how is it, uh, I mean, in terms of, are, are there good things also happening? Of course, there was a lot of discussion on uh, the, the, the negative impacts, but uh, is is uh, social media also shaping our identities as Bhutanese for the better? Is there anything good happening as well? A lot, a lot. Um, and I think uh, while um, uh, while the the rural uh, users are mainly uh, using them to reconnect or connect with their with their members uh, in urban areas, and now. Um, who are living living abroad? Um, uh, it uh, social media is also bringing um, in two things. First is the possibility to extend our spiritual practices. Now, by spiritual practices, as a Vajrayana Bajran, Buddhist, I'm talking about practicing uh, compassion and loving kindness, and uh, uh, and participating in <clears throat> the various rituals. Uh, so here, uh, I uh, we notice or or we can we can we can see that uh, people are able to participate virtually in these rituals and in practicing 
the compassion and loving kindness. Uh, the best example is the millions of neutrons that we raise in few hours or few days to help someone get a kidney transplant in Calcutta or or abroad. You know that is such a, such a heartwarming uh, development. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, as we are speaking, uh, I am actually uh, receiving uh, donations uh, for a donation that's going to happen in Xiamgang uh, in a few days' time. You know, the other uh, aspect of of social media is in the in coming together as a nation. And I looked at uh, the case study of uh, the Tenchu Gelsen phenomenon uh, during the 2017-2018. Uh, uh, I league uh, when Sencho was playing in India, and I've I've been I've known Sencho from a uh, very young age, and so uh, to watch him rise and and then you know explode in the Indian football scene, and to see every Bhutanese of all ages, of all gender, of all um, uh, ethnic groups, of all professions coming together mm -hmm. uh, as as a nation, being proud that this guy is is, is doing what whatever he's doing. I think that uh, also is another um, another example of uh, the use of social media. Uh, to paraphrase um, the sociologist Benedict Anderson, who who talked about uh, the print journalism, you know, uh, in the making of of a nation or the concept of a uh, nation. I think the social media uh, uh, use or the users have actually created that horizontal, uh, you know, uh, membership of people uh, of Bhutan uh, through, uh, you know, through following and and, and, and becoming proud of the works of Tenchu Kelsen. So I was very happy actually uh, that Tenchu was uh, recognized by his majesty, the king. Uh, he brought the country together in solidarity like no other uh, ordinary Bhutanese has done in recent memory. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, well, I, I think it's interesting how, uh, so, had this like a thematic uses of uh, uh, of social media, whether it's an uh, advocacy tool or like having it used as a crowd a crowdsourcing tool or nation building or having this building the sense of patriotism towards a common mm -hmm. mission or a vision. I think yeah, all of the, those is something that we also directly observe as you as as you uh, correctly mentioned. Um. Although Sir's thesis doesn't talk about, you know, the identities among children, but I know from the earlier responses, Sir, Sir touched upon the experiences you've had with your own, your personal experiences with your daughter. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, um, what do you feel? I mean, what what are the key, as, as a parent myself also, what are the key things as Bhutanese parents we have to be aware in terms of the impact of social media on, on a child's identity? Or, uh, you know, I mean, and and also at a very broader level, what, what are the key things that the government or even as parents in education should be doing to help children navigate this identity crisis, uh, especially in the context of, you know, social media usage? Yeah. Um, well, um, I think we are, uh, as we say, we are in a, in a very uncharted uh, territory with the social media and upbringing and, and parenting. Um, I'm not an early childhood specialist, so I cannot comment much on uh, the early um, childhood development. Uh, however, if you consider um, children as anyone under 18, um, uh, in sociology we uh, we say uh, those between 15 to 18 is is a is a period of adolescence um, when much of their identity is formed. Um, uh, at, at, at in in that period, so um, so I can talk a bit about what what um, what is happening uh, there. Um, now I think we need to understand that internet was um, introduced in 1999, uh, which means we are already seeing not one but two generations of uh, children who or people who are growing up with internet. So. Um, uh, which means uh, if you have a millennial in your family and, and a Gen Z, uh, millennial would be somewhere uh, people from uh, uh, 30 to 40 and, and Gen Z, those who are under 24, um, you would see them as very different personalities. You will see them as coming from different, almost uh, universe, you know. 
Uh, now, uh, now uh, for the interest of time, I will highlight just um, one or two uh, negative influences, the most important. Um, what I feel is um, the Gen Z and, and to a certain extent, uh, the millennials um, are uh, feeling a sense of, of loss of sense of belonging. They, uh, they, feel, they feel misunderstood or not understood by us, the adults. Um, and uh, that the, the, the reason is uh, that uh, that generation seems to be a more um, expressive, independent self, not an interdependent self that we are as Bhutanese. So I think there is this gap between my generation and my father's generation who look at ourselves as interdependent self and these young uh, people who want to express themselves as that, uh, you know, as that uh, unique uh, identity, uh, very independent uh, uh, character. And that's where I think uh, the, the, the tension is between, uh, or the international, intergenerational tension is there. Now, uh, uh, as I said, I, my studies have not covered uh, those in depth, but if you look at uh, studies from other countries, uh, there are many. Um, uh, what, what, uh, what's happening is that uh, adolescents uh, are feeling more and more isolated. They are uh, removing themselves from the traditional uh, communities, they are from the traditional support group. And they are either behind, uh, hiding behind the computer screens or the mobile phones, and and connecting more with the virtual community. Uh, now there is nothing wrong with the virtual community as long as that community uh, is, um, you know, meaning well. But one of the problem uh, of being in the virtual community um, is, first of all, uh, uh, the, the 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 detachment uh, from the reality. Uh, second, uh, it is um, uh, it is it gives you a sense of 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 an illusion of of being wise because uh, because of the abundance of knowledge out there. So everything is there, right? But knowledge is not wisdom. And to to do well in life or to proceed in life, you need wisdom, not just knowledge. And so of being knowledgeable or being wise so uh, so those are some of the things that uh, that i feel um is creating a tension between our generation and and the millennials and uh, the gen z's uh, but what we have to recognize as parents as um, policymakers as uh, elders is again the recognition of those three different chronotropic identities, the multiple identities that we all have. What we have to recognize is that they are as Bhutanese as us. They are a little different. They want to be a little more expressive and independent, and that's okay, you know. And uh, and I think uh, understanding that uh, phenomenon or understanding uh, or, or being more understanding is, I feel, the best approach uh, for us elders or the policymakers when it comes to you know, the identity crisis that our uh, children are facing. Thank you, sir. So uh, it's not actually the common argument often and the common debate is like the communal uh, collective society versus an individualistic um, society, but it's more like creating understanding yes. and acceptance was that multiple uh, identities that's occurring because of uh, of this influx of social media or technology. Yes. Um, yes. Let us move on to yet another interesting section of uh, uh, Doctor's thesis, which is this. Uh, I think we touched upon it a bit earlier. That interplay between social media, Buddhism, deities, and the ritualistic traditions. Now, mm -hmm. sir, did share examples about how it is helping spread good conduct uh, and how it's helping uh, crowdsource uh, things for spiritual, I don't know, uh, gatherings or functions. Uh, I was wondering because we, as we all know, we're also living in an age of uh, misinformation, miscommunication, misrepresentation. So uh, have you, during uh, your research, uh, experienced any of this kind of uh, misrepresentations or misinformation in terms of this uh, this uh, spiritual practices or even rituals? Uh, 
in your during your field work and and if the if you did then how did the community respond to it uh, among the um uh, spiritual or the religious groups that i was following um, i mean uh, nothing uh, nothing untoward uh, happened uh, be it in in terms of misinformation or disinformation uh, but i have uh, come across uh, you know, facebook and wechat posts of, of pictures uh, of of sacred uh, Buddhist motifs or statues, uh, you know, uh, being uh, being uh, you know um, being mistreated or, or or not treated with respect, and and yeah, I, I and, and I found um, that uh, the reaction uh, was a little violent, more than our generation. Uh, so, uh, so that was uh, that, what, what I what I noticed. That when you read the comment section, uh, you see there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, uproar among the younger Bhutanese than uh, the elder the elders. Um, other other than that, um, I must say that uh, spirituality and spiritualism has been the biggest beneficiary of the social media and technology. Um, as I was saying, like I'm able to. Uh, do a lot of uh, my spiritual works and and help uh, uh, some tatsangs and uh, through using uh, the technology. I use that uh, extensively. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, many rural temples and communities in eastern Bhutan that have uh, that have been left unattended for the last thirty years because of migration has been reversed thanks to uh, the social media. Uh, likewise, um, I see um, a lot of uh, Buddhist masters, like Zonza Kensei and, and uh, Gyavato Khampa, uh, even our own Pesling Tiku, you know, using, uh, uh, being very active on the social media and gathering a lot of followers. And I think all these things um, seem to indicate uh, yeah, that uh, the technology is not necessarily uh, bad. Thank you, sir. Uh, doctor, I hope the internet is steady at your end. At times, you do break down, but I think now okay. we, yeah, we, it's good for now. Um, we're now with this uh, open questions uh, from our audience. Sir. And um, of course, we have questions uh, from the Zoom. And then we will also have a look at questions from Facebook. I believe there is uh, quite a lot of plus, plus 40 plus viewers on Facebook as well, sir, just to inform you. So let me open uh, open up for questions if there are from this um, the audience here. So if you could, uh, I guess, raise your virtual hand, <laughs> then I'll be able to moderate better if there are questions. Uh, if not, I can read out the questions that's online. So, um, yeah, while the questions uh, and while the Zoom participants uh, think about questions or comments or reactions, uh, let me read out the first question from Facebook, sir. So it's here. So how uh, it goes, how effective are spiritual practices in strengthening community vitality given that not all individuals uh, in the villages adhere to spiritual beliefs and they're still engaged in uh, pre-Buddhist shamanistic practices, so Bornism, I believe, and may not take ownership of the temples despite support for initiatives aimed at organizing festivals and enhancing communal temples. So it's, uh, I think the question is about the friction between uh, pre-Buddhist uh, um, belief systems and the practices, and then the ones that is coming during the Buddhism era. And how does it play? Really, um, I mean, how is there ways that, uh, you know, we can find a balance where there's a better sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, if we uh, if we look at uh, the evolution or or the um, dynamics between uh, pre Buddhist uh, uh, traditions and Buddhism, uh, we see uh, one key point uh, in its history, 
uh, somewhere uh, in the 11th century uh, when uh, uh, the Buddhist and uh, and the Bonism um, uh, and the Bon tradition actually came together uh, after the legendary uh, tussle uh, between uh, Milarepa and uh, Bonpo uh, Master uh, Bonpo Narijung. Uh, and what happened uh, then is that uh, the Bon tradition uh, or the Bonpo masters agreed to, um, because they uh, they were so called defeated uh, in 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 the dust, uh, in the tussle or the defeat uh, or the debate with the Buddhists, uh, uh, the Bonpo masters agreed to um, uh, take in uh, the Buddhist philosophy of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, not uh, not taking lives, meaning uh, refraining from uh, sacrifices of live animals and people, and in return, the Buddhist uh, accepted to uh, to recognize the Buddhist deities and places and and nature worships. So there was this uh, there was this uh, uh, agreement uh, between uh, Buddhism and uh, and Bonism. Uh, to a certain extent, but following that uh, agreement, uh, two uh, factions appeared uh, among the Bon tradition, and uh, and one is called Bonkar uh, or the White Bon, and the other one is called the Bonnak, uh, means or Black Bon. The Black Bon refused to um, compromise with the Buddhist, uh, whereas the uh, White Bon uh, they have uh, integrated. Uh, what I what we call the Buddhist philosophy, uh, especially, and uh, what I uh, notice or what we can uh, uh, argue is that much of what is practiced uh, in Bhutan, uh, in the rural areas or in the remote areas, is actually uh, the white bond, which has uh, which has incorporated a lot of uh, Buddhist uh, philosophies. Likewise, uh, the uh, Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism has incorporated a lot of uh, bond rituals. Uh, in 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 their and in their practices, uh, having said that, there are few uh, shamanistic uh, and animistic uh, practices happening, uh, but they seem to um, uh, go about doing their own uh, in their in their own uh, places. Or I mean, they don't do that at the temple. Uh, they do uh, wherever it's necessary, uh, depending on which deity they are appeasing to, whether it's the deity of the tree or or the river or or or, or, or a rock, uh, and as far as uh, the temple is concerned, uh, it is increasingly uh, what I argue a social space as much as it's a spiritual place. Mm -hmm. So, uh, social uh, temple uh, is mainly a place for people to gather uh, for whatever reason, uh, and not necessarily to enhance their spiritual practices. Uh, this is from my own observation. So, uh, in which case, then I really don't see any tensions or or things happening. Thank you. So, uh, we'll go straight to the second question. It is it is something that we touched upon earlier? So, it's on uh, on on the cult <laughs> leaders. Like sometimes uh, there's this mass following, and then ultimately they come to know that uh, that uh, that person is a con, is a con man. And it's not necessarily um, uh, it's an not necessarily something that we uh, observe in Bhutan, but it can be also overseas. Uh, we hear that a lot from our neighboring countries. So, what are your uh, you know thoughts on those kind of aspects? Because even social media actually helps build those um, followers, sometimes yeah. very blindly. Mm -hmm. uh, well. Um... Uh, I think it is the same with any form of uh, of uh, scams or 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 or, or you know con men uh, appearing uh, from different professions. So uh, it's no it's no it's no different. Um, it's just that we have to be uh, careful uh, first of all, uh, and secondly, of course, not to be so gullible. And and that is uh, that that is um, possible only if we can be a little more honest with the questions that we ask, uh, being a little more critical, uh, being a little more, uh, you know, uh, to examine or do your research a little uh, more before, you know, jumping in and before, you know, taking everything uh, on, on face value. Uh, now, I don't want to generalize, uh, you know, uh, by by uh, saying every every 
<laughs> you know, uh, spiritual masters, uh, you know, have have won anyone. Uh, have I think I think there has been very few uh, instances or cases uh, that we have read about. Uh, for me, I have not really come across uh, any any anyone in my. Maybe just they just stay away from me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, sir, you, with, with all your wisdom, you're a better investigator. As uh, In any case, let's move on to the third question from Facebook. And that is, again, a very interesting one because it talks about the non bhutanese residents, about those who are settled in Australia, I don't know, America, Canada, and so on. So for them now, it's not the first generation. For ma majority of them, it's going to be now soon, second generation. For them... Uh, then, uh, I mean, how do they, uh, the question is, how could the present and the future dynamics of this Bhutanese community abroad differ as they seek to stay connected with their culture and tradition? So uh, while they are abroad, I mean, how do they still associate themselves as, as Bhutanese? And while, yes, social media might help, uh, you know, uh, reduce the proximity, but yeah. what, are, what are your general yeah. thoughts on this? Uh, so uh, if you go back uh, to the to my definition of uh, what it means to be Bhutanese, you know, we talked about uh, the personal self, the social self, and the spiritual self. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the spiritual self, uh, we mentioned about, uh, you know, nature and deities and places playing very important uh, roles. And I presented uh, this at the last Vajana conference about how deities uh, and places in Bhutan, sacred places, seem to bring people together. Uh, the best example is Parata Aksang and uh, Dechenpu in Timpu. You know how how how, how many people actually come there. Uh, you know. Uh, together. Now, unfortunately, uh, those who are living abroad uh, do not have that uh, physical proximity, or you know the. Uh, the, uh, or what we uh, in sociology we call the place identity factor. So uh, the place identity uh, theory uh, basically uh, claims that um, uh, your character or your identity uh, or the place actually uh, contributes a lot in terms of who you are as, as a person. So that's called the place identity theory. So, uh, so where we uh, may lack uh, for those who are living abroad is... Uh, you know, uh, this place uh, factor and the proximity uh, or the presence of the spirit uh, of the deities and the, and the places uh, in their life to uh, form what, uh, what I uh, say, uh, the interdependent uh, self. Uh, where, we, uh, where I see uh, a good solution, uh, especially for those uh, living in uh, countries where there are large uh, Buddhist diaspora, uh, like Australia, I think um, one can achieve some uh, level of social self uh, because there are a lot of uh, social gatherings and and and, and the Bhutanese uh, present there. Uh, but of course, um, we cannot deny uh, the fact that uh, children who are born in those countries among the Bhutanese diaspora abroad will definitely see uh, some shortcoming in terms of uh, defining who they are. You know, and so I, um, in my own uh, family, I try to discourage uh, my relatives from taking children with them if they are moving to Australia or to Canada, uh, saying they might be better off here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, saying early childhood specialist. Uh, what mm -hmm. impact uh, people have on mm -hmm. them, whether it's better to be with their parents or whether to be better to be in a in a safe community as uh, here. But uh, uh, obviously, it's it is something uh, that uh, that we will only know as we move on. Uh, but uh, my advice, okay, my advice would be for them to use technology as much as possible to stay connected uh, with your relatives back home. Take the numbers of the temples you uh, have, uh, you know, been associated uh, these days. You know, for example, I have I have the numbers of all the temples that I have been associated with, Tashigang, Zong, uh, Dongkola, Deshinpu, you know, uh, Rukhalam, uh, uh, because they are all on WhatsApp or, or on WeChat. So stay connected uh, with that. 
And if you do that yourself as parents, then uh, children will be observing you. Uh, so you really uh, do not have to say uh, that, uh, do this, do that to your children. In, a, in any case, children never uh, listen to us. Uh, they just <laughs> observe what we, <laughs> what we do. So as parents, as adults, do that. Uh, stay connected uh, with the deities, with uh, with the, during the annual loches. Stay uh, connected and and participate in the community and spiritual uh, practices uh, with the religious events in the country. Uh, and that would, I think, would be a good compromise, be, uh, you know, for those who are living uh, abroad. That's that's very uh, practical advice uh, to stay engaged and to stay involved as, as much as possible. Uh, and also, I think uh, your point about that there are many Bhutanese events uh, going on even in abroad. So make sure that uh, you attend and participate and also contribute. So that is also where you get the sense of Bhutanese identity, I guess, uh, refreshed. Uh, at this point, let me again ask the Zoom attendees if they have any questions, reactions, or comments on the conversation, then please, perhaps if you could raise your virtual hand. If not, we do have one question, which uh, sounds a bit confusing, um, Doctor. It's, it's actually reflected in the chat box. Um, how far do the elders of remote communities accept the expressiveness? So I guess it is um, uh, the expressiveness of the younger generations, the acceptance, whether there's this friction uh, between the, the elder communities and the, the younger generation. And perhaps uh, he or she is also trying to ask her, uh, our culture of younger being domiciled to elders as marked group good children blankets their growth of expression. So uh, I guess there's, uh, because of this friction, sometimes it can can be a barrier for the growth of children. So as you mentioned, I mean, children do not listen at the end of the day, <laughs> they only observe. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess the question is around that friction, whether they, ex uh, I mean, of course they exist, but your thoughts on that friction between the elder and the, the younger generation. No, uh, I think um, uh, the the intergenerational um, tensions are not just uh, prevalent in Bhutan, but it's it's everywhere. Um, you know, uh, for instance, uh, in Macau, where I was living, I observed a lot of uh, tensions between uh, between um, my students uh, who were young Chinese uh, millennials or Gen Z with their parents who are even more, um, you know, uh, even more uh, dominating than Bhutanese parents. So it's not, again, uh, that we uh, are facing that problem alone uh, on earth. Uh, uh, it's always there. Um, but as I was saying, I think uh, uh, we can go a long way as uh, as policymakers, as elders, as, uh, as uh, adults, if we recognize the fact that uh, the younger generation, the Gen Z and the millennials are different than us, I think if we uh, just recognize that, I think that would be a start um, uh, of finding some uh, solutions. Uh, what we are doing instead is that we, uh, we pretend or we think we understand the youth. We think we understand what the young people want. Uh, we think uh, we have all the solutions. And that's, I think, the tragedy that we are facing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the next question, Doctor, is uh, does the physical proximity really matter? Uh, because if visualization and that connection through that wholesome thought that, uh, you know, something that's in the headspace and that if, if it's, if it's can be done, then uh, would it matter for us to be physically present in uh, in Barotaksang, for instance? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the question is around the differences between really being physically present in a space uh, as opposed to being connected to the space uh, through technology. So, you know, how different those experiences are in terms of shaping identities. Yeah, uh, it does. Um, it does. Um... I don't know, uh, philosophically or social, uh, so, uh, sociologically, 
um, uh, I think I think studies have actually uh, you know claimed uh, the place identity theory that the place that you are born um, defines or 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 uh, adds to your identity as 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 a person over time. So if you're born um, in 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 Tashigang or in in the remote. Uh, uh, areas of Shemgang, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you will develop a very different identity to as compared to if you're living in, in the streets of Thimpu or Paro. Um, spiritually, uh, or, or, or to look at uh, that from a very spiritual point of view, of course, uh, you know, that's why we have paradoxon uh, to, for people to do their meditation and achieve uh, the a certain level of uh, spiritual accomplishments so definitely um it's it's different from uh, you know seeing a picture of Tang and being uh, in in, in Tang. Uh, likewise i think uh, for children growing up um in 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 canberra or 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 in sydney i think it will be very different from them you know uh, growing uh, in paro or or, or in tashigang uh, definitely there will be a marked uh, difference but again, uh, as I was saying, uh, as parents, as elders, as relatives, we can try to fill uh, that gap, that vacuum, as much as possible. It, it is possible. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think there aren't any more questions. So perhaps we can move on to the concluding section of this dialogue and uh, the... I think the first question I have here is where can people find your thesis and whether it's public, if they want to dive more, yeah. if there's a place they need to go to. Yeah, uh, it's still in the uh, in, in, in the in the economic circle, uh, in the pro quest and also uh, which require uh, uh, subscription and, and stuff like that. But if anyone is interested, they could uh, uh, easily drop me an email to me or to the Lillian Foundation. I'll be very happy to send them uh, the PD PDF, okay. uh, but I will be um, oh developing this into a book. Uh, what it means to be a Bhutanese, uh, try to translate uh, uh, into a more humanly possible, readable language than <laughs> than we academics uh, tend to talk with. Thank you for the great news uh, for layman. But I mean, of course, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, I struggled with the, the term chronotop. So you would be definitely looking forward to read that book. Um, mm -hmm. as we are in, in our conclusion uh, section, uh, perhaps if Sir could you know try to distill whatever we discussed. Of course, it's not fair, but uh, for the purpose of simplicity, perhaps like the two or three key essential messages that came from your research? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I think um, we have to accept uh, the sad reality and that uh, technology and social media and mobile phones will be with us all the time now, uh, hereafter for a very foreseeable future uh, as far as humanity can go. Uh, but then... Um, uh, at national level, um, as my research shows, uh, social media can be used or it's a powerful tool to uh, bring people together as a country, as a nation, uh, uh, you know, into what uh, Benedict Anderson calls uh, the horizontal membership uh, of, of its members. Uh, at individual level, I think um, social media uh, can uh, help uh, to define your interdependent uh, self. Uh, which uh, I mean, which defines us who we are as Putnis. I think we can uh, we can try to use uh, technology as much as possible to stay connected with your family, to stay connected with your community, to to reconnect uh, to the community from where your father or your grandfathers uh, came from. Uh, these are all possible, uh, and. Uh, I think these uh, these would be uh, the two things that I I, I would uh, invite people. Thank you, beautiful sir. Um, so now it has rather become a tradition to ask each of the uh, speakers, the guests, about a you know about a recommendation on a book that has actually proud uh, profoundly influenced you or played a role in shaping your life choices or principles or also directed uh, who you have become. Now, sir. So, do you would you mind sharing us this this one book that you really 
that has actually helped you in your uh, journey? Um, well, I, I don't have uh, one book as such. Um, uh, what, I, what I do is, uh, anyway, um, I don't read fictions. I read uh, non-fictions. I read biographies of mm. uh, people uh, who have been in the world before us. And what I do is I pick uh, uh, things that uh, sticks with me uh, from those uh, life experiences of others. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, Richard Branson's book um, uh, made me uh, rethink about my relationships with people I hire or people I work with. Uh, I try, uh, yeah, he, he encourages you to treat your employees uh, the best you can so that they don't leave you. Uh, from the book uh, of Jamie Zeppa, our own Jamie Zeppa, uh, it inspired me to become a teacher. So that's how I ended oh. up in academia in my third uh, career. Um, but if you insist on one book, I would say uh, Outlier by Malcolm Gladwell will be something that I I invite people to read or, or, or to reread. Uh, but then there are also other um Buddhist classics, uh, like the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Uh, I always have that uh, book with me, and I read and reread the chapter on compassion when I forget to practice, or if I <laughs> if I need to, you know, uh, spice up, spice myself up. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. It's such a great list. Um, any concluding thoughts, uh, Doctor? I mean, we have shared a lot uh, over this uh, past hour, but uh, just some concluding remarks that you have for our audience. Yeah, um, maybe like I can just try to uh, give a working definition of what it means to be Bhutanese. Uh, you know, to be Bhutanese, I think, uh, is to be compassionate, collectivist, and spiritual, and be cognizant or recognize one's place uh, and duty uh, in one's family, uh, community, and country, and then practice the sharing of the space with uh, other beings that are both seen and unseen. So uh, basically, um, you know, uh, practice compassion, collectivism, and spiritualism, uh, and, uh, you know, to know your place uh, or to appreciate your place in your family, your, you know, your community, and in the country uh, as, as productive citizens, as someone says. Yeah, and then to also understand that we share the space with not just, uh, you know, uh, human beings uh, or with the nature that we see, but also with the, uh, with the uh, supernatural forces. Such a beautiful thought, uh, Doctor. If I may um, share my uh, my thoughts, uh, it's uh, it's actually beyond the tangible expressions of what me what it means to be put in it. It's not about go and kira. It's not about the rituals. It's more about the sense of being um, that uh, yes. the compassionate uh, that that sense of duty you have in your uh, mind. The the kind of that sharing of space, that collective space that you have, not only with the the beings that you actually see in front of you, but some some uh, you know invisible forces that are out there. So it's mm -hmm. it's very beautifully said, Doctor. And uh, with this, uh, we have unfortunately come to a a, a, a conclusion of this uh, dialogue. And I extend really a sincere gratitude to you, Doctor, for uh, for agreeing. Uh, to be with us for the second time, to sharing this uh, also for sharing key insights into your PhD thesis, and which we also look forward to reading in the form of a book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, uh, while uh, this hour of conversation can't fully encompass this extensive work, which I had the privilege to go through, it does provide an opportunity to delve uh, into some of the significant finding and and for this I think every one of us who are listening if one on Facebook as well uh, are ever so grateful I'm not even going to try and summarize what uh, and spoil what I feel was a very <laughs> crucial conversation now I'll just end here so thank you once again sir for joining us and uh, heartfelt thanks to our audience for tuning in and uh, until next month, please have a wonderful rest of the day. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Doctor.